Hello and welcome to the Liverpool.com podcast. I'm James Martin and I'm joined today by Matt Addison. We've got plenty to talk about, including the latest on Ruben Amarem. And then we'll be moving on to a couple of other topics. There's been some whispers about Luis Diaz, which we'll get to. Um, but we'll start with Amarem. Yeah, we saw reports yesterday, didn't we, Matt, that sort of a deal in principle was agreed, a verbal agreement sort of coming out of Germany. And they've they've been kind of knocked back. So um, it, it doesn't look imminent, does it? No, I think he's definitely the uh, the front runner in most people's minds. But then again, maybe Xavi Alonso was a few weeks ago. So there's there's no guarantee that that will end up happening. I think Liverpool insist that they are continuing to look at a number of options. They will, um, as ever, be guided by the data and take the time over making the the decision. Um, but I think I think most people have come to the conclusion that Ruben Amorim would make a lot of sense at this point. Um, I think. It's probably also a bit of a delicate thing in terms of you know, sporting going for the title. It looks like they're going to get over the line there, similar to how it would have been, in fairness, with Alonso. If Alonso had decided he was going to move, that conversation really and any sort of confirmation probably would have took place after the uh, the league had, had finished. I think probably it will be similar with Amarim as much as he has been asked several times now and has never really refused to, to rule out the fact that he might be leaving. In fact, he's kind of actively said that, that there's a decent chance he might be moving. I think in, in a couple of different interviews, the, the the conversation around that, I think at the same time as it's a possibility, I don't think they would want that to overshadow the, the remainder of, of this season. So it's it's tricky, really. I'm sure there will be conversations going on behind the scenes, but I think Liverpool would want to be respectful. And I think Ruben Amarim, if it is to be him, I think he'd want to be respectful for the rest of the season, if nothing else, because it means that he would you know, potentially end up with a, a league title to, to win at the end of it. So there's, there's still a delicate balance, I think, to be struck. But I'm sure Liverpool will be making progress because, you know, they, they haven't got loads of time to, to work these things out as we're going to come to. There's a number of things that they have to do this summer. Obviously, primarily is finding a Jurgen Klopp replacement. And after that, the other stuff can then sort of come into to place and, and take shape. Yes, that's what we'll be diving into shortly, whether it's Amarim or someone else. There's definitely a fairly extensive to-do list. But just briefly on Amarim, we're not going to spend the whole show talking about him and his pros and cons. But just to put you on the spot quickly, you say that he looks like the front runner. Is, is he your front runner? Do you think that he is the one who could sort of bring the most to Liverpool now that we know Alonso's out of the running? Yeah, I think so. I think there's, there's still... Um... There's probably three candidates. I know we've spoken on here before about Nagelsmann and how much I like him as a coach and how much I think he's, um, you know, a really good football manager. Um, I, he would still be in a conversation for me. I think the issue with him really, as ever, is the, the Germany thing in the summer. You can't really wait until after the Euros to bring somebody in. That just wouldn't make any sense. I think it's only uh, just less than a month between the, the final of that and the, the start of the Premier League season, it's only a, a week or so, I think, without having checked the, the calendar. It's it's not long anyway between um, the end of the Euros and Liverpool going on the tour to the US. So that doesn't really make any sense. That The speculation around him is that he will extend his deal with Germany, if anything. There's sort of Bayern links and various other things that look up. Uh, that, that look to be sort of happening behind the scenes with him. So he, he would be on my list. Roberto Bizerbi, I think, is one that has been overlooked to a certain extent beyond that though there's not loads of of options really so I think Ruben Amarim looks like the one who is the best fit probably also the one that Liverpool could have probably almost the free runner I think Barcelona are, are interested I, I think that um, has been fairly well reported that, that they will um, be looking obviously for a new manager and, and he would be the obvious one but then the, the question marks around them and, and how appealing that would be, I think, would would come into it. To me, it does it does make sense that Amarim adds up for Liverpool, but probably Liverpool adds up for, for him as well. It, it feels like a natural step, I would say, for both parties. So I think that's that's where the idea that he is the front runner comes from. Um, that's not to say that it's guaranteed. Um, that's certainly not to say that they offered him anything or that they've had meetings or that it's agreed. You know, as far as we're aware, that's that's not the case at this moment in time. But it does feel to me like that's the, the most likely one. And I think Sporting, uh, well, Sporting certainly beat Benfica 
Uh, I think it was on Friday night, wasn't it, that one? Um, so there's a little bit of a, a gap at the top of the Portuguese league. Maybe if they can wrap that up with a couple of games to go, maybe then we'll we'll start to hear something a little bit more concrete. And let's say he does come in, I think possibly he might have a new sort of, maybe not priority one task, but it, it'll be right up there. A report from the Telegraph yesterday that Luis Diaz future sort of in doubt in terms of there's been contact with his agent from PSG. Barcelona as well have been have been sniffing around, although their financial situation maybe makes that move a little bit less likely. But it was pointed out in the report that, you know, it's maybe a little bit unusual in terms of how Liverpool have done things in the past, that Diaz is, you know, two years into his initial deal at this point and hasn't been offered an extension despite, you know, what, what most would would say is pretty strong form. Obviously, the injuries being in there may be disrupting that. But yeah, the, the report described it as a crossroads for Liverpool where they have to decide whether they want to cash in or whether they want to kind of renew. Um, you'd assume the new manager would have some kind of say in that, but it, it's a big decision, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's interesting that his dad has spoken a couple of times about, you know, potentially a move to Spain. Even Atletico Madrid was being talked about at one point, I think. It, it, it's a bit of an interesting one for Liverpool. I can see the, the argument definitely for it being a crossroads. I think there's definitely, you know, a, a decision to be made on in one way or the other. I, I don't know, though, which way I would go personally. Um, I, I think there's definitely, there's obviously, for, for obvious reasons, an argument to, to keep him. He's, you know, 27. He's still got another level, I think, to, to kick on to. He's overcome a significant injury during his time at Liverpool. I think we've we've not seen the best of him because he's not really had time to, to do that yet. I think, you know, the injury obviously took a lot out of him. He's then come back and, and had to get back into to a rhythm. Um, I think it, it's probably at the point now where you'd you'd start to make that decision. But I don't think for me there's enough of a body of evidence yet to decide is is Luis Diaz at his peak now or is there another, you know, another level for him to unlock in terms of, of those numbers. The numbers haven't been too bad in terms of the goals and the assists, but... I think this week in particular, after Liverpool have just had 30-odd shots against Manchester United and, and not won, probably the, the conversation returns about, you know, not just him, but Nunes and probably Cody Gakpo as well in that conversation of, are they clinical enough? Do they do, um, you know, enough of the, the stuff in the final third that you'd want them to be able to do? Is there an upgrade that Liverpool could potentially go for? But I don't know, the, the, the conversation around him is interesting, whether the, the transfer links come because... He is almost wanting to force that decision. He either wants a, a new contract or or maybe a move somewhere else. It's it is a bit of a tricky one for Liverpool. And I think the fact that it comes in a summer where they've already got a few other things to think about, they've already got a decision to make on obviously the manager as we've discussed, but also, you know, Mohamed Salah's contract and, and his future. I definitely can't see a scenario where Liverpool would want to lose any more than one of the forwards. I'd be surprised if they wanted to lose any in an ideal world. I think we've had conversations on this podcast in the past about how I would go out and, and sign another forward in the summer. I think there's definitely an argument to be made around going for an extra one. If you lose one, then it's obviously you're trying to find two in order to, to, to get that extra body in there. So it's almost one of those where you can argue it either way. I... I would be surprised to a certain extent if, if Liverpool were to lose him this summer, but you know the, the money being talked about around seventy five million was was the uh, the figure in the Telegraph report. I think I think that would make me think twice. Certainly, if Liverpool got an offer like that for a twenty seven year old who's already had a big injury, is at the point where you're going to have to offer him an improved contract if if you want him to be there for the next sort of three, four, five years. I think that would certainly be be interesting to me. Um, and I suppose that the other interesting element is which clubs would it be? I know I mentioned, you know, that, that his dad has, has spoken about Madrid and you know, Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid. I can't really see them going for a player. Certainly Real Madrid this summer, they've got more than enough attacking quality. They're probably going to end up with Mbappe. That doesn't feel realistic. Barcelona, as we mentioned before, the finances around that just doesn't feel realistic. It really is PSG or, or nothing. Can you see him at PSG? Yeah, I suppose maybe that could be appealing for him, but I, I don't know. I, I I still I still would be slightly surprised by it. But if seventy five million was on the table, I don't know. It would certainly make me think about it. Yeah, I think you're right. That the price being sort of banded about is 
it's the main thing and I think it's worth noting that that's sort of what Liverpool valued him at according to the report rather than kind of the bid that's necessarily going to come in but I think yeah that's that's maybe the point where you can sort of start having the conversation about as you say basically doubling the money on a player who's had a serious injury and, and is maybe sort of entering the end of his, of his kind of peak years potentially but yeah that sort of goes against my instinct because my instinct immediately would be no of course we don't want to sell him I think he's been very good in the last few weeks I think we've seen him sort of get back to something approaching those pre-injury levels and I think he's also kind of offers something a bit different to the rest of the Liverpool attack I think we've seen when he has been out that you sort of lack someone who's brave enough to kind of take on the man to to sort of run at them and 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 progress in that manner you know we've maybe seen him do it a little less as well since that injury but I think still he's he's the one in the team most likely to to do that and then his battery is incredible you see him just running and running and running for for the full game I think he brings you know an awful lot to this Liverpool attack still and I think like you say that the timing of the report is, is maybe unfortunate in the sense that it comes after that United game where where everyone's taking maybe a slightly longer look at the Liverpool attack and, and, and asking questions they maybe weren't asking before. But yeah, for me, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be selling, I don't think. Because even with seventy five million in your pocket, who do you buy that, that brings the same thing at the same level? Yeah, I think the, the conversation around does he score or assist enough him and Nunes and, and all the others, part of it is is the Old Trafford thing. Of It's it's the recency thing of, well, they didn't do it in that game, so you know whatever it might be. And, and I know there's it's kind of been bubbling under the surface, but I also think there's there's been a few conversations around, oh, well, if, if Liverpool have Mane or Firmino, I mean, that isn't fair to me either because... Okay, Sadio Mane. Yes, that there was you know periods of his Liverpool career where he was really consistent. But again, that is a little bit of recency bias. The last season, you know, the, the second half of that season, yes, he was banging them in left, right, and centre. But before that, that wasn't necessarily the case. And you know, Roberto Firmino had probably one season where I think he scored twenty eight, twenty nine goals in in a season. The rest of those seasons, Roberto Firmino missed a lot of chances as well and wasn't necessarily you know, as, as clinical as, as what maybe some people remember of him. Similar with Diogo Jota even, obviously, he is a player that is a bit of a killer. He's someone who has a, a huge amount of talent. I think he will be a huge boost for Liverpool for the rest of, of this season if he can stay fit. But I do think there's maybe, um, I suppose, some rose-tinted glasses with, with looking at a few of these players. You, you look back and, and think of Sadio Mane being absolutely perfect on on every single chance. I don't think it's really fair to compare Luis Diaz to that standard because it, it just isn't true. Yeah, it's, it's a good point to make. And you, you can see almost in real time the same thing is going to happen with Salah. Because, I mean, at the minute, people are even getting on his back saying that he, he misses too many. And, and he has missed some big chances, you know, certainly this season. But, you know, throughout his, his Liverpool career, his sort of brilliance has been in the sheer quantity of chances he can get for himself. He's maybe again aside from that first season he, he hasn't been one to kind of take every single chance being ridiculously clinical he's kind of stays at or about his expected goals he doesn't really underperform or overperform it too spectacularly so you can imagine as soon as he goes then that'll be the standard that everyone's held to this kind of mythical Salah who scored every chance that ever came and as you say that's that's just the way it goes it's it's the nostalgia effect so yeah, it's unfair to hold players to these standards that, that no one has ever really hit. But yeah, it's 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 also understandable that the attack is questioned. It's not just the United game where where chances have been missed and, and you do look and think, you know, is it how much is it going to cost Liverpool at the end of the season? So so there are questions to be asked around the attack and and you can see how maybe if the right offer came in, Diaz would be one you'd you'd at least consider a sale for. But the other big question in the attack, of course, is Salah. Um, because as as you've sort of alluded to, he's ticking into that final year of his contract again. So whether it's Amarim or whether it's another manager, that that's going to be high up the, the to do list, isn't it? To sort of sit down not just with Salah but with Michael Edward, with Richard Hughes, the new sporting director, and think, well, what do we want to do here? Yeah, and again, it's it's one that you can probably argue either way. I think there's definitely an argument that if Liverpool are to lose Salah at some point in the next two or three years, then you need to try and get a fee for him. Um, whether that fee would be as high uh, as it would have been last summer, not that there was any chance that Liverpool should have got rid of Salah last summer, but it, you know, with 
with the fee that was being offered, you know, 150 million pounds, is that going to be the case again this summer from Saudi Arabia? Would Saudi Arabia be as appealing this summer to Mohamed Salah? I suspect it would certainly not be. I think if you look at, at what has happened with that league, you only have to look at the, the quotes that Karim Benzema came out with last week to sort of point you in the direction, really, that that hasn't gone as, as well as what he thought it would have done. I think if if you're Mohamed Salah, you've just got to, to listen to some of the things, not just Benzema, obviously Henderson, various others as well. I think the quality of, of that league, it would effectively be like retiring, wouldn't it? You'd be on a huge amount of money, but it just wouldn't be the same. Liverpool are going to return to the Champions League next season. You know, to, to compare and contrast the, the Saudi Pro League with the Champions League, there's just no, no comparison at all, is there? So I think that would definitely have to... Uh, well, the in, the interest will still be there, but whether it's there to, to the same extent, really, from from either party remains to be seen. But I think for, for Liverpool, there's there's definitely a conversation to be had in terms of the, the leverage of the Saudi interest. I think last summer, it would have been harder to tie Mohamed Salah down to a new contract because the interest from Saudi was there. His agent and his representatives would have been able to point to that and say, well, they're going to offer X times, you know, whatever Liverpool could offer. I think this summer, it, it's probably harder to make the, the argument, really, that it would be appealing to Salah. And there, therefore, it, it would be, um, you know, in theory, slightly easier to get that deal over the line. It's probably also worth adding that Salah has had a bit of an injury and maybe hasn't quite had the season, certainly in the second half of the season, since Christmas to, to now, that if he was in... The, the sort of form where he's scoring a goal every game. Again, that makes it a little bit more um, easy for his representatives to, to try and demand huge amounts of money. I think maybe there's there's a bit of a, a cooling off period almost at, at this point where if you're going to try and do a negotiation, probably now is, is the time to try and do that. But I think more than the finances, I think more than that, it will come down to whether Liverpool want to offer him you know, a, a two-year, three, four-year extension. I think if if Liverpool are prepared to, to put down a substantial time period for him, I think that might come into it more so than the actual finances itself. But again, with him, you know, Saudi Arabia aside, maybe PSG could come in for him. Um, obviously, they're going to have you know a lot of money from um, the, the savings that not having Kylian Mbappe on the books will will hold. That will will go towards a few players, I'm sure. Maybe Salah could be one of them. Even that, you know, would that be appealing? I'm not too sure whether he'd want to end up in in Paris. Um, and beyond that, there's there's not loads of other options for him, is there? There's there's no there's no obvious place that if he was to leave Liverpool this summer, he could end up. You'd probably have to to look at it being another Premier League club, which I just can't see. Barcelona couldn't afford him. Real Madrid have got other priorities. Beyond that, there's there's not really anywhere else that he'd want to be. So, I think there is a conversation to a certain extent, but. Again, I would be very, very surprised if, if Salah wasn't at Liverpool next season. And for me, the obvious solution is to, to try and agree a two or a three year deal. Uh, and maybe in two years time, you look at it and say, well, maybe by that point, the, the Saudi Pro League has, has got to a level where it would be appealing. Maybe they would be able to, to give you 150 million in, in two years time. Maybe that would be you know, a sensible solution where you're not losing Salah now. What, you're also not going to lose him on a free yet at some point. I think that that makes the most sense. When there's a summer of change, I think keeping Mohamed Salah makes makes even more sense than, than ever before, really. Yeah, I was going to come to that, actually. We got a, a comment from someone saying, for a new manager coming in, stability is very important. Keep hold of as many of the first team players as possible. So it sounds like you concur with that in terms of keeping things the same, more important than ever, with, with so much change going on, sort of behind the scenes, in the dugout. Uh, and I suppose that moves us on from Salah as well to a couple of the other ones. I mean, Trent Alexander-Arnold is in the same boat, one year left come the summer, and of course Virgil van Dijk as well. You'd think that Trent is the one which the club at least wouldn't have to think twice about, It's just in terms of making sure they can they can tie him down to that. But van Dijk, I suppose there, there's a little bit of a debate to be had as well in terms of his age profile. Um, but I'm assuming you're, you're firmly in the camp of, of keep the stability and try and tie both of those ones down as well. Yeah, and I, I get the feeling that that one will be slightly easier than the Salah one. I think we've seen with previous experience that Salah um, 
knows his worth and his agent isn't going to make that you know a particularly easy or quick negotiation necessarily i think with virgil van dijk he's you know the liverpool captain he's a center back which makes it easier i think for, for liverpool to say well yeah we can offer three or four years on him because you know i think he's himself spoken about tiago silva being someone he wants to emulate he wants to go on for a long time at the top of the game it's probably also worth remembering that he wasn't playing at the absolute elite level of football until sort of 25, 26, when he comes to Liverpool anyway. I think that plays into it, you know, with Southampton, I suppose with Celtic, there was, you know, European um, experience there. But, you know, the, the Scottish League isn't the, the same intensity as it would be if he'd have been in, I don't know, in, in Spain or in Germany or wherever previously. I think that there's definitely a lot of, of reasons to think that he could go on and, and still be at the level he is now for the next few years. And I think ultimately that is the, the question mark, isn't it, over both of, of Van Dijk and Salah, the age that they're at. The question that you've got to work out is, you know, the, the level that they are at now, is that sustainable for another two or three years? I think with both of them, it, it is really. Mohamed Salah isn't the same player that he was when he first came to Liverpool, but I can see him being the player he is now for, for two or three years quite easily. Van Dijk even more so, given the position he plays, it doesn't feel like either of them are about to drop off or or about to to have lots of injuries. The Mohamed Salah injury of, of the last couple of months that that doesn't feel like the start of oh well now he's just going to get loads of injuries. It, it just feels like a natural thing that happens with players. So for me, that the answer with both of them is to to give them new deals, extend, and obviously with with Trent as well. I think, as you say, that one probably is uh, is the most obvious one of of them all. Um, Liverpool can't be complacent with it. They've got to show him that they value him as, as highly as, as they would any other player. But I think with with all three of those players, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Really, you know, I'm sure transfers will be the talk of the summer because they always are. But if you can tie down all three of those players, I think that's as important as as any signing that Liverpool could make. Really. Yeah, and I think an interesting element when we're talking about Van Dijk as well. I mean, you briefly mentioned Thiago Silva there. I think what sort of enabled his longevity, I mean, as well as the fact that he obviously looks after himself very well, he's, you know, his, his awareness of the game, his positioning is excellent, but, you know, on top of that, he's, he's primarily been playing in a back three. And I think that that does make a difference. I think we've mentioned it on here before, but yeah, especially if the next the, the next man through the door for Liverpool is Ruben Amarim and he's the one sort of trying to sort out all of these, these kind of issues or, or dilemmas, if you like, then, we know that he's played three at the back pretty much throughout his his admittedly fairly young managerial career. That doesn't necessarily mean Liverpool would switch to one, but you know it's certainly one of the options on the table. And if that were to happen, that would potentially change the conversation around Van Dijk even more. But but what it certainly would do is uh, is when looking at transfers, make it even more important that Liverpool enters the market for another centre back. Uh, I think probably that's the area where Liverpool might be looking at strengthening, regardless of whether it's going to be a back two or a back three next season. But would you say that's kind of transfer priority number one for whoever the new manager is? Yeah, I think so. I think it makes sense to add that depth. Um, I think if if Matip goes on a free as we expect him to, then you've probably got to, to look at, at getting somebody else in. There's maybe one or two you know, potential um, Gerald Kwanzaa repeats, I think, um, Luke Chambers has, has done very well. It'd be interesting to see how many minutes he gets. I know he obviously gets minutes in the first half of, of the season in the Europa League and then goes out on loan and has done really well with Wigan. So maybe there's something like that where you could have somebody step up. But I think Liverpool have, have got to be, um, I suppose, got to learn the lesson of, of a few years ago where they got a lot of, of injuries at centre-back. They can't afford for that to be the case again. Unfortunately, Ibrahima Kanate is not the most... Um, robust player at the best of times. I think, you know, clearly the quality that he's got, um, the ability that he's got is is undisputed, but you've got to be really careful with him. And, you know, we, we mentioned the age that Van Dijk is. You know, Thiago Silva, yes, he can be emulated, but he doesn't play every single game and he hasn't done for the last few years. There's There's got to be a bit of a succession plan, I think, in terms of, of that. There's got to be rotation. There's going to be more matches next season. Those matches are going to be of a higher level and a higher intensity and a higher quality. I think they've got to go and, and do another centre-back to, to be able to rotate. Now, 
Jarrell Quanta will absolutely be part of, of the uh, the conversation next season for Liverpool. He will play a lot of games. He'll go on and, and do great things for Liverpool. But I think they need an extra option to, to just rotate in there just to make sure that if there are one or two injuries or you know there are one or two concerns, maybe if Canate can't play twice a week, then you've got somebody who can come in and, and rotate and, and play in those games. Obviously, Joe Gomez, we know, has, has had a great season, but that's primarily been at fullback rather than at centre-back. He can become another option in the middle for next season. But I'd be surprised if they move to a back three, even if it is Amarim. But even if they, they stay with, you know, a, a back four with, with two centre backs, I think I think to me it, that's the obvious that that's the only real position across the entirety of the pitch where you'd think they're really short. I mentioned before I'd I'd quite like another attacker. I'd probably quite like another midfielder as well, just to, to make sure that they've got enough depth. I think centre back is, is probably the only position where you could look at right now and think they could probably just do with one more. Yeah, I mean, I love Kwanza. I think he's had an incredible season and I would have no qualms with him sort of being in the same place in the pecking order moving forward. But I suppose you would say, you know, if you'd said at the start of the campaign that he'd be starting away at Old Trafford in, in this kind of game, you know, it's one, he's such a young player, maybe you'd rather have avoided it. Of course, there's. That's not that's not hindsight speaking. It's not because he made that error. You know, I thought otherwise he had a very good game. So it's just one of those things that happens. But just purely in terms of looking at the depth, it's not necessarily the the situation you'd, you'd have wanted at the start of the season. So yeah, it's maybe one to to remedy, as you say, especially with Matip likely to be on his way out. Um, but of course, we've seen Inacio linked with with that role. He's plays for Sporting at the moment. We've seen Usman Diamande, the other Sporting centre-back linked. It's kind of inevitable given the Amarim links. I think they'd both be plausible targets, even if it wasn't Amarim who came in at Liverpool. As you mentioned with the manager, it's going to be a case of, of the data leading these decisions uh, and perhaps more than more than it has been in the last few years. I mean, that's not to say Liverpool has ever abandoned the data by any means, but it, it's kind of it's been well documented that Klopp's influence has grown and, and rightly so. You know, he's, he's earned that kind of say in recruitment. But you look at the timing of Michael Edwards coming back into the fold as Klopp is leaving. Obviously, Richard Hughes coming in as the new sporting director, which is a position Liverpool hasn't had permanently filled for, for some time. So you look at it and you think that's going to be another thing high up the list of the new manager is going to be to sit down with those two, isn't it? And kind of sketch out a plan collaboratively, something that works for the tactics the new manager wants, but also for the the sort of broader vision that, that Edwards and Hughes are hopefully cooking up. Yeah, and I think it's important to say as well, it doesn't make a load of sense to go out and buy loads of players this summer. I think, let's let's just say for argument's sake that it is Ruben Amarim that comes in. He'll have a good idea of what Liverpool squad is like. He'll be able to to, to know broadly what Dominic Sabos like can do or what position Harvey Elliott is, is going to play in, in that system. But I think it would make one or two signings, one or two signings would make sense this summer. And then you can kind of assess where Liverpool are at beyond that. You can, you know, maybe have a little bit of an experiment with the, the formation in your first season. You can maybe have a look at Harvey Elliott in a couple of, of different positions. You can have a look at, you know, where does Mohamed Salah fit into to this? It, it's not going to be the case. I think that you come in and you know exactly everything about all of these players. I think whoever the new manager is, it's going to take a little bit of time to, to bed in, a little bit of time to work out where each player is best within the system that they want to play. And, you know, beyond that, then you can start to have a look at, I suppose with the age profile as well, Salah will be a year older. If Luis Diaz stays next season, maybe you know he'll be you know twenty eight by the summer after. Maybe there's a bit more of a conversation about what you do with his future at that point. I think for for this summer, stability is is the right word to go with. I think they do need a centre back. They probably could do with one or two other players in in other positions as well. But it, it's certainly not going to be as wholesale as what it was last summer, where. You know, there were a few surprise exits and obviously a lot more transfers in, in one position than what we expected. I think I think it will be a little bit more stable, keep it as it is. And ultimately, Liverpool, you know, they're not top of the table, but nobody's got more points than them in the Premier League this season. It wouldn't make sense to make wholesale changes from a team that is clearly heading in, in the right direction. So, yes, stability definitely is is the word of the summer for me from this point. 
yeah, plenty enough to do this summer without worrying too much about transfers. But we'll keep you up to date with everything that does happen in terms of the new manager search. And then in terms of what comes next, we've talked about transfers, we've talked about contracts. That's all to come. And of course, at the end of the season, still very much top of our thoughts. Let's see how that pans out. We'll keep you up to date with all of that as well. For now, Matt, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, we'll see you all again soon on the Blood Red channel.